People matter to God, every single one of them. Jesus was born for people, lived for people, died for people, conquered sin and death for people. As we prepare to celebrate Easter, it's time to let people know this day is for them. This is our calling, our commission. The power of the resurrection has changed our lives, but it's not meant to stop there. The life-changing love of the cross, the unquenchable passion of the grave, the unbeatable power which rolled away the stone is meant to pierce the hearts of people. This Easter, don't keep it to yourself. Step out, reach out, speak out, and invite. All right, hello. How's everybody doing? Easter is coming. Are you excited? Just a little bit. (laughs) There you go. One of you is a lot. One of you has the right answer. This year, our Easter service is titled The Day. I can't tell you what that means. I know it's vague. I know you may be wondering, but here's the deal. You got to just come back for Easter to find out why it's called that. And there is a really exciting reason that it's called the day. But I'll give you a little spoiler just for you guys. Is that all right? Since you're here and you're part of our church family, or you just you chose the right time to be here. I'll give you a little spoiler about what Easter is all about. God wants you to be free. Did you know that? Uh, more than he wants you to be happy. More than he wants you to get your way, he wants you to be free. And here is the promise of Easter. Are you ready? God's going to get you free. He's going to get you free. You may be sitting there thinking, there's no way. You don't know how long I've been stuck this way. You don't know how long I've had these bad habits. You don't know how long my past has haunted me. But here it is. God's going to get you free. That's the message. And God might make a mess to get the message across. But that is the message that he's going to get you free. And it may not be all that fun, and it may get messy, but if he has to be whipped and scourged and broken and crucified, guess what? He's going to get you free. That's what you can hope for. That's what you can put your faith in is that no matter what has me imprisoned and ensnared, God's going to get me free. And so I know there's people in this room that you are trapped in bad habits. You are trapped in your mind with things that weigh you down, like depression and anxiety and just your thought life in general. And you are trapped in your past. God's going to get you free. And you know people in your family and you have friends that you know You can just tell by being in their life, they're not free. They're ensnared by whatever it is. Well, I encourage you, bring them to Easter because Easter is about freedom. And it's about looking at the life and remembering the resurrection of Jesus that breaks the bondage of everything, even death. You can't get more bound than death. Do you know that? Like once you're in the ground, you're in the ground. Y'all don't believe me. Once you're in the coffin, six feet under, you're in the ground. And you're staying there unless you are Jesus. And so what do we do? We cling to Jesus with everything we've got. All right. I I was hoping that would get you pumped for Easter, but I don't know yet. We still got another, another, the rest of this service and another week to get you there, though. So, Easter is the exciting culmination of the Christian calendar. Okay, so next Sunday 
is known as Palm Sunday. That's where we remember that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And by the way that he rode into Jerusalem, he was proclaiming himself as king. And then we go through that week, which is known as Holy Week in the Christian calendar. We get towards the end of that week. You have Maundy, Thursday, Good Friday, and then it all culminates in Resurrection Sunday, which is known as Easter. So Easter is the big event of the Christian calendar. What we're going to talk about today is the culmination of the Jewish calendar, and that is called Passover. It is the big event of the year for the Jewish people. And these two events, Passover and Easter, they overlap and they go together every year because of the events that are going to play out at the, in the last few days of Jesus' life. All right? So today is not actually Passover. Passover occurs not at the end of uh, this week, but the end of next week, right? It'll be uh, on what we'd call Good Friday will be when Jewish people are celebrating Passover. But I thought uh, since, you know, most of what we do occurs on uh, Sunday mornings, our services anyway, most of our services occur on Sunday mornings, um, and we have Easter that we celebrate Um, we would take today and we would look at this moment in time called the Feast of Passover uh, that Jesus chose to help us understand what his death was going to be all about. All right? Okay. So we're going to pick up in Matthew chapter 26. We're going to kind of set the scene for this Passover celebration. Uh, Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, whose name was what? Judas, Judas Iscariot, he went to the chief priests and said, what will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. All right, that's about 4,000 bucks, okay? And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now let's stop there for a second, because this is kind of interesting. This is one of the greatest mysteries in Christianity. Why in the world did Judas do what he did? You may think you know the answer. I'm going to give you a spoiler. Nobody actually knows the answer. Okay? If you think you know the answer, that means somebody told you something and you just grabbed onto it. But nobody knows exactly why did Judas do what he did. Some say it's for money, but you all may be able to relate. I mean, $4,000, that's not a small amount of money, but it's probably not really enough. Like, I wouldn't change the course of my life in such a way over $4,000, I mean, I'd be looking for a little bit more than that, right? So $4,000 in Judas's day, is that really all it took? Well, again, we don't know. Um, others have theorized, uh, why is he called Judas Iscariot? Iscariot is not a last name that historians and Bible scholars would be familiar with. So there's a couple theories of what that means. It may just be the town that he's from, like Jesus is Jesus of Nazareth, Judas Iscariot may be a man from a certain town. Um, another theory is that Judas may have been a Sakari. Can you say Sakari? Sakari. Uh, before he started following Jesus, Sakari is the Jewish or the Hebrew word for assassin or a guerrilla fighter which means Judas could have belonged to a group of Jewish freedom fighters. And what they would, what the Sakari would do is, you know, they'd hide out behind boulders and things and they'd jump out and they'd take out Roman uh, garrisons of soldiers and things like that. Because remember, Jerusalem is occupied by a foreign army. So Jewish people, Israelites, they don't like that Romans are in there. And so there were Jewish freedom fighters, assassins, guerrilla fighters known as Sakari. And one theory is that Iscariot is a play off of that. But the truth is, as I said, no one throughout Christian history has ever truly figured out why Judas did what he did. But at some point in his life, as he walked with Jesus and he heard Jesus talk about how We need to turn the other cheek when our enemy strikes us. That we need to love our enemies as ourselves. Jesus even said one time, if a Roman soldier gives you his backpack and tells you to carry it a mile, carry it for him too. 
John gives us the only indication of maybe what Judas was thinking because the Gospel of John tells us that Judas wasn't really excited about what Jesus was doing with all the money. He thought Jesus was being careless with the money because Jesus pretty much gave it away to those who needed it. So John gives us a little bit of a hint. But all we can try to kind of piece together is that Judas eventually came to a place where he did not see Jesus as the deliverer and the king, but he saw him as a threat and a problem that needed to be removed. And so in Judas's mind, he came to a place where he thought it was good and it was right to turn Jesus over and get rid of him. Verse 17. Now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the what? The Passover. You, that's the name of today's sermon, service, the Passover. And you may notice that it is called and known as another name, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You saw that just a few, uh, a couple verses earlier. That it, Passover and Unleavened Bread are the same time of year. And Jesus intentionally chose this time, the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover, he chose that as the time he would go to Jerusalem and die. I know sometimes we think things just played out and Jesus just ended up being crucified and resurrecting on some random day. Whenever it happened, it happened. But no, Jesus actually had a plan and he was intentional that this is all going to go down and come to a head during Passover. That's how it was going to happen. Jesus had that planned out and we can see that that is what he was trying to do and we see his plan play out as we go through this passage. Now, <clears throat> um, Bible nerds out there. I don't know if there's very many. I've got one. One. Okay, that's all it takes. I just need one. Bible nerds out there, so one of you will find this interesting. I find it interesting, and I have the microphone, so I get to share it anyway. But the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they present that Jesus is having a Passover meal on Passover. However, if you look at the Gospel of John, John seems to think and present the Passover meal as happening the night before. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they say, no, this is a Passover meal on Passover, which would be the Friday. But John says, no, this is the night before that all this is happening with Jesus and his disciples at their Passover meal. Well, what's going on? Um, <clears throat> this is what I think is happening. And most Bible scholars would agree on this point. Um, you know, we have marked just kind of a random time in the middle of the night where magically it turns into the next day, right? We call it midnight. And we just, somebody decided this is when that happens at some point. Um, and that's how our days and calendars kind of work, right? Your iPhone switches over to the next day when we get to midnight. Now, uh, for Jewish people, it's a little bit more intuitive than that. For them, the day ends when the sun goes down, okay? When the sun goes down, the previous day is over and the next day is beginning. And so it appears that what Jesus is doing, he knows he doesn't have a whole lot of time. Remember, he knows what he's stepping into in Jerusalem. He knows he doesn't have 24 hours to wait and do the whole Passover thing on Friday. So he does something that the Jewish calendar allows for him to do. And he has a Passover meal with his disciples on what we would call Thursday night, which is a little uh, different. It's kind of like celebrating Thanksgiving the night before, um, but the Jewish calendar allows for Jesus to do this because, again, the day ends and the next one starts when the sun goes down. So that is the scene that we are in, and as the scriptures tell us, this is all going down in the wee hours of the night. So Jesus is with his disciples, most likely on Thursday night before everyone else in Jerusalem is going to celebrate Passover. And so Passover in Jerusalem, it's going to be really uh, full of energy and a lot of bustling, the city of Jerusalem gets cram-packed with about 100,000 more people at Passover in Jesus' day. So imagine if we just were in your hometown and just over 
this short week, we cram in a hundred more thousand people. Can you imagine all the stuff going on and the crowded streets and all the people? Like when the Chiefs won the Super Bowl, when the Royals won the World Series. We have no sports fans. I can't even, I can't get you with baseball or football. <clears throat> And so this is the scene of Jesus' Passover. He had just gone into the city and made a big scene coming in, proclaiming himself as king. And then right after that, he goes to the temple and starts flipping tables. And so here's the point. There's a lot of people in Jerusalem. They all know who Jesus is, don't they? (laughs) Jesus is that guy that just rode in and everybody was waving palm branches and saying he's king. And then he went and like lost it in the temple is what we're hearing. And he was whipping people, like all the people we love and respect because there are religious leaders. He was using a whip and flipping tables. Okay. So we know who Jesus is at this point in the story. He's like a well-known figure in the city. And when we get to verse 18, this is one of my favorite parts in the story because I call it the spy movie moment. Y'all like spy movies? Because look what it says. This is like real life spy movie. Matthew is writing it. Verse 18, Jesus said, go into the city to a certain man. Well, who's that guy, right? Well, we don't know because this is the spy movie. And most likely, literally historically, Matthew knew that putting that man's name would be dangerous because again, Jesus was seen and crucified as a, as a, as a political rebel, right? So even in the writing of the gospel, Matthew's, the author of Matthew, no, we're not putting this man's name in this passage because that's not safe for him. So it's a certain man. Jesus says, go to this certain man and say to him, the teacher, right? Because I don't want anybody in these crowded streets hearing you say, Jesus, just tell him the teacher and he'll know what you meant. Because remember, Jesus is playing this whole thing out, right? So he's got his contact in the city, in the crowded streets. Go to this man and tell him the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and they prepared Passover at that house. So again, just imagine Jesus, everybody knows who he is. So he's sending his disciples out. Find this certain man. He'll know what you're talking about when you tell him the teacher needs your house. Jesus has got his hoodie up. He's kind of moving through incognito to get to this place because everybody knows who he is and what he's done this week. He spent his whole ministry being kind of undercover, keeping it low. Hey, I healed you, but don't tell anybody what I did. And now this week, he's just been very public with his ministry. So they set up the Passover, and then when it was evening, he reclined at the table with the 12. Now, a lot of times when we talk about the Last Supper, this Passover meal, you have in your mind this painting that Leonardo da Vinci, da Vinci gave us, didn't, don't you? Where Jesus is sitting, very regal, at the table, looking to his side, and his disciples are on each side. That's a beautiful painting. And, uh, you know, contributed a lot to art history and everything. But for today, I need you to just erase that out of your mind. All right? That is nothing like what Jesus' table would have looked like. Uh, It would have looked more something like this. And as you can see in verse 20, it says he was not sitting at the table um, with his disciples, but he reclined at the table. Because this is how uh, they would have a low table like this. And many Eastern cultures today, they still eat like this, where you sit on the floor and you recline at the cushions um, and you sit in a half circle or whole circle depending on your setup. And so this is the image we need to have, something like this, when we think about Jesus' last Passover. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a Passover meal together. All right? right? Now, I need to tell you, I told first service, this is the only moment in this message where I'm going to preach to you. But I need you to hear this part, all right? This is the preaching part. The point of Passover is the repetition of it. Jewish people do, have done this every year for thousands of years. Thousands of years. In fact, this is the oldest religious meal in history. And it happens every year. And by Jesus' day, it had been happening every year for about a thousand years. And for, in our day, it still happens in Jewish culture for another, you know, about 2,000 years. What I want you to hear, because you're new wine people, and we like the new stuff, and we like that God is doing new things, but what you need to hear is that uh, not every 
thing in Christianity uh, needs, is about being new. Uh, I could put it this way. Um, the novel thing, the new thing, is not always a virtue in Christianity. Are you all listening? If you remember our Vision Sunday service, it was talking about that God doesn't make all new things. He takes old things and makes them new. And so when we're talking about being new wine church and new wine people, what we need to understand is it's not like reinventing the wheel, like we're going to do everything a new way. We got a new whatever, new process, a new everything's new. No. We look at what's been handed down to us faithfully, and then we say, God, breathe fresh life and restoration to this thing and make the old new. You all get that? That's real important. New wine doesn't mean I'm casting out all the old stuff and the old is just blah, <laughs> right? New wine means, no, this old thing that's been going on, and we're going to see Jesus do this with this Passover meal, this ancient thing, this thing that God gave us. Well, there's going to be a new breath of fresh life on that, and it's going to be made new. And Jesus is going to do that exact thing with this Passover meal. Um, so I need my volunteers. I have a couple volunteers. I'm going to use the same ones because they did an awesome job first service, and now they know what's going on. You guys are going to be able to lead this whole thing, aren't you? Isabel, you got it? No, okay. Next time. We are going to have a Passover meal. So you guys, you know what to do. You can just find your seat, get comfortable. Now, this is a family meal, and so it's going to be interactive. So you guys are part of our table, okay? And so there's going to be some things you need to say and recite, and you have to do it or we're not going to be able to get through this thing. A Passover? What was that? Oh, that was me. Okay, my phone went off. Man, that's a bad, that's a bad look. I thought it was you, Isabel. <laughs> the Passover meal takes about two hours. So are you all comfortable? Okay. <clears throat> I have uh, distilled it down, and I think we're going to get through it in about 30 minutes. Some of you, did you all hear that? Just want to make sure you caught that. Okay. We're going to try to get through it in about 30 minutes. Now, some of you have probably experienced what we call the Seder meal, the Passover meal, and most likely what you've seen is uh, the modern form of it. Uh, but just like, you know, the way we celebrate Christmas today would look completely different to how people celebrated Christmas 200 years ago, uh, the modern form has some extra elements and some things that have been added throughout the centuries and millennia now at this point. So, but most likely, the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples would have been very simple. And so I have just stripped this down to the bare bones uh, for time's sake and to try to illustrate um, as accurately as possible what Jesus and his disciples may have experienced at their last Passover together. So, just like any good Jewish feast, you have to have good wine. All right, guys? And so, you both are 21, right? I know, the joke isn't as funny the second time around. Welcome to my life. I have to do the same joke every, every week two times. This is sparkling grape juice, if you're wondering. It's not really wine. We don't, we don't encourage underage drinking at New Wine Church. <clears throat> but it is the good stuff. The good sparkling Welch's grape juice. So Passover, the meal is broken into four movements that is divided by four cups that we will drink together. To start Passover, or at the beginning of each cup, the head of the house will say a blessing. And I'm going to sing that blessing to you in Hebrew, and then you will all repeat it because it will be up on the screen for you to read. So let's take our cup, raise it to the Lord, and I will bless it. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu molech haolam Bore puri agafen All together. Take a drink. 
<clears throat> All right, so Passover is beginning. The disciples are at the table with Jesus, and everybody's having a good time. It's festive, right? This is a time of remembering deliverance uh, from, from oppression, and leave it to Jesus. He is going to kill the mood, as he often does. So we're all excited. We're having a great time, and then Jesus speaks up in Matthew 26, verse Uh, 21. He says, as they were eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they became very sad and began to say to him one after another, is it me, Lord? Who is it? Which one of us? Now, the irony of this story is by the time Jesus gets to the cross, how many of his 12 disciples are going to be there with him? You can answer me. Zero. So they will all leave him and betray him. But we know because the story has been setting us up for this that there is one in particular who is going to betray him and hand him over to the religious leaders. And then Jesus said, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. And at this point, we're reading and thinking, Okay, well, we know who it's going to be. Somebody's going to reach their hand and they're going to dip. In the bowl with Jesus. But here is what is interesting is that uh, the way that a Passover meal starts is with a dipping in the bowl, and we would each dip in the bowl at the same time. And so it is called the dipping of the carpos. And so you guys can take your lettuce leaf. And what we would do, this is how the Passover meal would begin, is we would take a chunk of lettuce, you all got your little slice of lettuce, and then in your colored dish, just really mix it around. Make sure you get a lot on there, Caden. Yep, you can keep going. Just really get a lot, okay. And then you just got to go ahead and take a bite. It's all right. So what we just did, we dipped it in very, very salty water, and we took a bite. Now, why, <clears throat> why do we do that? Now, Passover is a symbolic meal. It's not a meal just like any other meal that you eat. It's a meal fill, filled with symbols that represent things. So why do we dip the carpas, the vegetable, in this really, really salty water? Well, the oldest interpretation of why that happens is because it is a way of reliving and remembering the story of Joseph. You remember Joseph? He's the son of Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, and his youngest son is kind of a punk little kid who thinks he's all that and has some dreams and about how his brothers are going to bow down to him. And his older brothers are like, no, that's not going to happen. But he is his father's favorite son, and so his father gives him a very expensive coat to wear. Um, One day, though, his brothers decide uh, that they are going to murder their younger brother, Joseph, while they're out in the field. But one of his brothers, named Judah, speaks up and says, no, let's not murder him. Let's sell him into slavery. You all familiar with this story? And they take his very expensive coat from his father, and they kill an animal, and they dip his coat in, does anybody remember what they dip his coat in? The blood of what kind of animal? A lamb. They dip his coat in the blood of a lamb. They ship him off to slavery in Egypt and they bring the bloody coat back to their father and we say, sorry, your son, your prized son of promise is dead. And so we dip the carpas so that we remember the dipping of Joseph's coat in that lamb's blood. Because when you bite your lip, You ever bit your lip, you get kind of that blood taste in your mouth, it tastes salty, right? So this is a way that we remember and we experience the blood that Joseph's coat was dipped in. And that event is the event that started and initiated Israel's um, trip down to Egypt. That's how they got to Egypt was because of what they did to their brother Joseph. Now at this point in the meal... 
Uh, remember, this is a family meal that Jewish people would have done year after year. Uh, this point is where the little kids would usually speak up because anybody around little kids, you know, they have a lot of questions, don't they? So they're like, why did I just fill my mouth full of salt water with a bland piece of lettuce, right? And so what we're going to do this morning is uh, we're going to be the elders at the table, um, our, our wonderful young people up here, and you guys are going to be the kids, okay? You don't seem very excited. It's going to be good. You guys are going to be the excited kids, and there's going to be some questions pop up on the screen. And what I want you to do is I want you to just pretend you're like from five to seven years old, and you're asking these questions. So you need to speak over each other, be really loud. You all know what little kids do, right? They don't wait in line. Just ask whichever question, ask it loud, just like this auditorium is filled with the little children at the table. Are you ready? Is it up on the screen? All right, go for it. <laughs> wow, you guys are really, you're really good at that. <laughs> all right. So what we, after all the kids are asking questions, the head of the house, you know, we try to get it down. Okay, all right, all right, all right. I'll tell you. And what we would do at this point is we would read a, a couple of very long passages from the book of Exodus. It takes about 40 or 45 minutes to read through it. Um, we don't have time to do that today, so I'm going to give you the abbreviated version out of Deuteronomy chapter 26 of why we do this meal. So <clears throat> our people, the Israelite people, they are descended from a man named Abraham. And Abraham was a wandering Aramean, says Deuteronomy chapter 26. And God made promises to Abraham that from him and his descendants would be formed a great nation. But Abraham didn't have a single child. But God ends up fulfilling his promise to Abraham in his old age, and Abraham gives birth to a son named Isaac, and then Isaac gives birth to a son named Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons, the youngest of which is Joseph, the story that we just heard um, during the dipping of the Karpas. Jacob's family is living in the land while Joseph is down in Egypt and there comes a famine to the land where they have no food. And so they have to go to Egypt to seek provision and guess who they find in charge of the storehouses in Egypt? Their little brother Joseph that they have sold into slavery. And so through that event, the family of Abraham and the people of Israel find themselves in Egypt. And they are living and dwelling in the land of Egypt. And centuries and centuries go by. And they populate and they multiply. And they become a mighty people and a nation in the land of Egypt. But then our story takes a little bit of a turn. Because just like happens um, in many cases throughout human history, the native population of Egypt see that these people are becoming mighty and gaining power and they decide in the name of national security that they need to put a stop to these foreign people in their nation. And so the king of Egypt, you all remember his name? Pharaoh. The king of Egypt, Pharaoh, he enacts a genocide of these people. And he says every male child that is born is to be killed. Every Israelite male child born is to be murdered. And so an entire generation of Israelite men are just wiped off the planet and taken out of the, his, the history books. <clears throat> and so the people of Israel are then put into slavery and hard labor. They're to build Pharaoh's palaces and his storehouses. And so they cry out to God in the midst of all of this oppression and they say, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, remember your promise that you made to Abraham. And so God hears their cry and he raises up a deliverer. What's his name? Moses. And so through Moses, God enacts 10 acts of righteous judgment against Pharaoh 
in Egypt. But at every step, every act of judgment, God pauses and he says, okay, it does not have to go this way. This can be different. Just let the people go. Set them free so that they can worship me. But Pharaoh just keeps inviting the hammer over and over again, right? He says, who is the God of Israel? I'm Pharaoh. I am king of the world. I don't know the God of Israel, and he has no power over me. So no, I will not let the Israelites go. And so these 10 acts of judgment, they culminate in the final act, which is a devastating act against the Egyptians where every firstborn is killed. And that is what this meal leads us up to. But through that act, the final plague, Pharaoh decides to release the Israelites and they are set free. And so the main core of this story is that it is a story about freedom. This is a story about deliverance and the deliverance of the Israelite people from oppression in Egypt. Now, after we got done through, got done re, uh, going through the story of the Exodus moment and the deliverance of Israel through Egypt, we would all recite together Psalm 113 and remember what Yahweh our God has done for us by releasing us from oppression in Egypt. And so that's going to come up on the screen and you will read and recite the parts that are designated for the congregation. So, Psalm 113. Praise Yahweh. From the place where the sun rises to the place where it goes down. For Yahweh is high above the nations. Who can be compared with Yahweh our God who is enthroned on high? Now, traditionally, we would have sang that, so aren't you glad that I didn't make you all do that? <clears throat> At the conclusion of Psalm 113, we raise our second cup, and it would be blessed. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu molech haolam Borei peri agafen All together. Cheers. <clears throat> now, Rabbi Gamaliel used to say, you're familiar with Rabbi Gamaliel. Y'all know him. He's not the most famous Bible character, but you, you are somewhat familiar with him through his most famous student, who is Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Um, and Saul, his student, had a conversion experience with Jesus and he was sent to spread the gospel of Jesus to the non-Jewish nations. And so Saul uh, decided to stop going by his Jewish name and start going by his Roman name because he thought he would relate better to non-Jewish people if he went by his Roman name. And what is his Roman name? Paul. And so we know him as the Apostle Paul. But his teacher, Rabbi Gamaliel, he used to say this, that Jews all over the world, they celebrate Passover in a bunch of different ways, and there's different traditions, but you must have three elements to your Passover meal, or you have not celebrated Passover. Those elements are, you have to have the unleavened bread, you must have the bitter herb, which I apologize again for Isabel, and you have to have the Passover lamb. And so the first element is the unleavened bread. So you guys take your bread there. And the feature of the bread that makes it different <clears throat> than most of the bread we're used to is that, see, it's flat, right? It is unleavened. And what causes bread to rise? Yeast. And so why, at this meal that's a symbolic meal, why do we have unleavened bread? Well, Exodus uh, chapter... Which Exodus chapter 12 tells us, With the dough the Israelites had brought from Egypt, they baked loaves of unleavened bread. 
The dough was without yeast because they had been driven out of Egypt and they did not have time to prepare food for themselves. And so imagine you have to get out of Egypt quick because the doors have just been open for your nation to leave. And the Israelites, they don't have time for the bread to rise, correct? If you've baked bread before, you know it takes time for it to rise. And so they have their hiking boots on, their backpacks on. This is food for the road, right? This is like a power bar. We don't have time for the bread to rise, and we need to eat this as we go. And so that is why we have the unleavened bread. It reminds us of the haste that our ancestors had to leave Egypt with. And so Jesus takes this bread that his disciples would have been very familiar with. They had done this their whole lives. They knew the meaning and the story of the unleavened bread. And he blessed it. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu molech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. All together. You can eat, your, eat, eat the bread. Now, as they were eating, Jesus is going to drop another bomb, as he has been doing. It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, and he said, take, eat it. This is my body. Now, that's a weird thing to say. Even in Jewish culture and with this symbolic meal, believe me, that's a weird thing to say. That's not part of the Passover meal. His disciples are not used to somebody saying, this is my body. They are used to this being the time where they remember their ancestors leaving Egypt. But Jesus says, this bread you're eating now, it's my body. Well, what does that mean? Well, think about how do you make bread. You have to press it and knead it and roll it. And what's Jesus know is about to happen to his body? It's about to be broken and tortured. And how do you make bread? You put it into the oven, right? And you bake it. And Jesus knows that in the next 24 hours, he's going to be going through his own fiery furnace, this Roman execution rack of the cross. And so he tells his disciples, this bread, this is my body. And for uh, Jewish people, and actually most cultures still to this day, bread is the staple of their diet. And that is their main source of sustenance and food and life. And so Jesus is telling them this bread that you eat every day, that gives you energy and and nutrition and life every day, that's my body. And so we're thinking, we live by bread. We live by the broken body of Jesus. Bread sustains me. Jesus is saying his body sustains me. Bread gives life. Jesus' body gives life. And so the disciples, the disciples are sitting around the table and they're pondering, what does this mean? This bread is his body. The next portion of the meal that we would take, partake in is called the bitter herb, maror. You all say that? Maror. And uh, so guys, you can pick what you want to use again. Go with lettuce here. And just take a piece of your lettuce. or Kind of stir it up and get a big, nice big chunk of the maror. And when, are you guys ready? We'll do it on three together. All right, one. Wow, you got a really big chunk, Caden. I can't, I'm not going to do that. (laughs) All right, one, two, three. good. Now, 
<clears throat> the point of the bitter herb is that you cry. That is, is the point of it. And uh, Isabel's, she's doing okay. Her eyes are not, are your eyes watering this time? Okay, good. They were a little watery first service. But the point of the bitter herb is that you cry. And so imagine, again, remember the little kids are like, why in the world do we do this? So imagine every year they take a bite of this maror, this bitter herb, which is just chopped raw horseradish. Uh, that we just ate. Imagine you're a little kid and you're like, why in the world do we do this every year? This is not fun. Well, here's why. Exodus chapter 1, starting in verse 12, it says, the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel, so they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and they made their lives bitter. That's the Hebrew word maror. They made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. And so what we are doing in this symbolic meal, when we take the bitter herb and we cry, we're actually not just understanding and remembering and learning what the history of the Israelite people are. We're actually participating in it. We're participating with our tears and with the pain that the bitter herb gives. Every generation of Israelite sees themselves as the generation who were in oppression in Egypt. And they see themselves as the generation who came out of Egypt. And we we cry because we participate with our ancestors who who were oppressed and who were enslaved. And we cry because of the human condition, because all people everywhere are subject to Pharaoh's And every generation is subject to a new Pharaoh that rises to power. And the Israelites, they cry because even their own people, under the reigns of kings Solomon and and Ahab and Manasseh, they became like Egypt. And their kings became like Pharaoh. So we cry because our own people became like the people who enslaved us. And we weep and we remember that we are only delivered from the power of the pharaohs in this world by the grace of our God. And so the last element of the Passover meal is the Passover lamb. And uh, we don't have any lamb on our plate today, not only because it would have probably gotten like soggy and cold by the time we got up here, and I've put Isabel through enough (laughs) torture today. But you'll notice as we read this scripture that in Jesus' Passover meal, the lamb is very noticeably absent. And so it may be um, that because Jesus, again, is doing this meal on Thursday night before every, every other Jew in Jerusalem would have been celebrating their Passover, maybe the lamb was just not prepared yet, or more likely, Jesus is just kind of doing his thing again. And he's going to recenter the lamb around himself. Because what is the purpose of the Passover lamb? Well, this brings us back to that final plague that God enacted on the people of, on, on Pharaoh in Egypt. Now, Pharaoh had his heart hardened and he would not release the people of Egypt, even though God gave him chance after chance after chance after chance. And so God says, I, one is going to come and the firstborn of every household in Egypt is going to be killed by this spiritual being who in Hebrew is only known as the destroyer. The destroyer will come and the firstborn in every household will be killed. Now that's really intense for us. And it's, it was very intense. Um, but it is God matching Pharaoh's oppressive evil with his justice. But God provided something that Pharaoh never provided, a way of escape. And God said to Moses, tell the people that on this final meal, before the destroyer comes, if you will butcher a lamb for your meal that you were going to eat for Passover, but before you cook and eat the lamb, take its blood and brush it across the top of your door and down the sides. And when the destroyer comes, he will see the blood of the lamb and he will 
pass over your house. Now this way of escape that God provides, it is not just for Israelites, this is for anyone in the land of Egypt. Egyptian, foreigner, Israelite, whoever has the blood of the lamb over their house will be spared. And so we know that that blood of the lamb is what marked the people of Israel as God's people. Everyone who had the blood on their doorpost, they were the ones whose family came out intact and they were led out of Egypt to worship their God. And so it is a marker of them as a people, the blood of the lamb. And it is also a sign of the grace of God that absorbs the justice that is coming. It, it serves as a substitute where the justice of God comes, but the blood of the lamb covers so that, in this case of the Exodus story, the firstborn is spared. But Jesus, he takes the cup, and the Bible says in verse 27, he took the cup, and he blessed it. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu Molech HaOlam Bore Puri Agafen. Y'all read. Take a drink. And then Jesus said, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So see again what Jesus is doing. He's taking this ancient symbol of the lamb and the lamb on the doorpost, which is a strange symbol to us, but it's part of the story. And he takes this symbol that they are very familiar with. His disciples know. And he says, this cup you are drinking, this is my blood. Because Jesus knows that in the next 24 hours, his blood is going to be everywhere. His blood is going to be all over the streets. It's going to be dripping down his body and it's going to be covering that cross. And what's he say? He says, that blood, it's like the blood of a lamb. To his disciples, he says, you know what the blood of the lamb means in this story? How it sealed the people of Israel? My blood that's coming tomorrow in this atrocity, in this horror of crucifixion. My blood, it's the blood of a lamb. And it seals and marks the new covenant people of God. And Jesus is saying, my blood, it's going to serve is that substitute where the righteous justice of God comes. But when the blood is applied, all those who are under it, all those who dwell under the blood of the Lamb, they are passed over. Their sins, their shame, their guilt, their selfishness, it is passed over by the blood of the Lamb. You see what Jesus is doing? He's taking this symbol that we are not always super familiar with, but that they are very familiar with. And he is reinterpreting it, re-showing it around his life, his body, and his blood. And this, these very few symbols that we've looked at today are all Jesus gives us and all Jesus gives his disciples at the table to understand the horror that's about to happen in the next day. And apparently, that's the end of Jesus' Passover. So, can you guys give our volunteers a hand? They did awesome. Jesus, you know, he's so wise because he could have given a theology lecture about the purpose of his death. He could have laid it all out logically for us, and many of us may have preferred that. But what's really interesting is 
with how important Jesus' death is. You all agree it's pretty important. And Jesus thought it was important. And he talked a lot about the fact that he was going to die. His disciples didn't really get it, but he said, I'm going to have to die. But when it comes to why he was going to die or what the purpose of his death was, Jesus has almost nothing to say in the entire Bible about the purpose of his death. Isn't that interesting? Really, the only thing that he says with his words are, I have to die for the ransom of many, to be the ransom for many. And so you can put all of Jesus' words about the purpose of his death on less than one page. And we think you should fill up like at least half of the Bible with why Jesus is dying and the purpose for his death. But Jesus is so wise because instead of doing that, he gives this meal. This meal that they were already acquainted with, that they knew all the symbols, and he gives us a meal. And then he begins to reshape that meal with all of its symbols and all of its meaning around the meaning and the purpose of his own death. And so just, you know, imagine every generation of Israelite, they see this meal as them participating in the story of their ancestors. This is how we participate in the Exodus moment. And so Jesus gives this meal to his disciples so that this is our way that we participate in his life, in his story. Do you see that? This is the way we don't just understand it. That's the first part, that I understand who Jesus is and what the meaning of his death was through the bread and through the blood and through this Passover meal. But More than that, Jesus gives this to his disciples, not just the 12 there, but every generation of disciples so that they all participate in his life, in his story. So that just as every generation of Israel saw themselves as the ones who were leaving Egypt, every generation of Jesus' followers sees themselves as the ones who were sitting at that table with him on his final night. And imagine how you, if you were an Israelite and you see all the nations around you, the Canaanites, the Babylonians, those from Johnson County. <laughs> and you look at them and, and you see and all you hear is how progressive their society is and how great their technological achievements are all the awesome things they're doing. But then every year, Passover comes around. And you are reminded, oh, this is who we are. This is the story we belong to. And so in our lives, you have influences in the world around you that's telling you, hey, this, this is who you're supposed to be. This is what your dream and your aspirations should be. This is what it means to be a human, right? You need to have success and all of these things according to the world's standards. But then every month, right, we get filled with all that stuff, all these words spoken to us, all these ideas given to us. But then every month, we come together around the table and we remember, oh, this is who we are. This is the story we belong to. I've got all these different stories going on. Got all these different narratives being given to me. But this is the one that I belong to. And just think, you know, Jesus, he has a certain view of the world. He has a view of people He takes this story that goes like this, if we can pull that slide up, because the Passover story is that it goes in this movement that through the lamb, Yahweh rescues the Israelites from slavery to Pharaoh. 
Notice Jesus takes that basic storyline and he kind of swaps out all the characters in his Passover. And so now his idea is that through Jesus, Yahweh rescues the world, everybody, from slavery, not to Pharaoh this time, but to sin and death. Because, see, Jesus has this view of humanity that we are actually in slavery. But we're not in slavery to Pharaoh, but the human heart is entangled and ensnared by selfishness, by sin, by death, by this self-preservation instinct that says, I'm going to do what's best for me and my family and my people group the people I identify with, I'm going to do what's best for us, even if it's at the expense of you, right? It's that zero-sum game that we're all familiar with, and that just seems how the world is, that for the wolf to eat, the rabbit has to die, right? And that's the condition of humanity, even though we don't always see it that way, that a lot of times for me to get what I want It's going to have to be at the expense of you. But see, Jesus sees that as something that is part of the human condition, part of sinfulness and selfishness of humanity that is strangling humanity and every human heart. And that that, and he sees the course of that, that that is going to lead to death, not just individual death, but the destruction of humanity as a whole. But he believes that he can set all of humanity free by dying. That he will conquer the train wreck of all of that stuff we just talked about with his love. And we can see he believes that because he knows he's going to die, but then he says, hey, I won't drink this Passover cup with you guys again until my father's kingdom is established. So he knows, hey, there's another Passover coming. Do you see that? We're eating and drinking and having this Passover meal, but there's a new Passover that's coming, and I will drink with you again when what he calls his father's kingdom is established. And so, as you may have noticed, we took three cups of the Passover meal And we're going to take the fourth cup all together. And so if you would all stand with me, the worship team can make your way back up here. Here's what we're going to do. Um, In a moment, the band will play and you will come up and get the bread and the cup as we take this meal together. This meal that Jesus gave to his disciples that we take month after month. And, you know, we've distilled it to just the bread and the cup, but this is what we are doing. And this is what I want you to do this morning is remember I am participating in in this story of Jesus' Passover. I am participating in Jesus' story and his life. This is how I, I don't just, I don't only remember it and understand it, that's part of it, but I actually participate because I eat the story. I drink the story of Jesus. And so as you come today, some of you, you know, uh, you have some things that you need to bring to Jesus as you come to his table. For many of us, there are things we have done this week um, where we have become like Pharaoh. You, we probably all could say we have contributed in some way to the system of this world and the way this world is. And what we need to do when we come to the table of Jesus every time we come is say, is just repent of that. Say, Jesus, that is not the story and the narrative I belong to. I belong to the story of King Jesus, who was not an oppressive king, but who was a king who laid himself down. Others of you, maybe you've just got really lost in all of the different things that people tell you you need to be. And today I invite you, as you come to the table and you take the bread and the cup, to just recenter yourself around who you are in Jesus. Remember, these are markers of the people of God. 
this marks me. This has sealed me by the blood of Jesus in his family as his child. That is who I am. And so I will bless this final cup. Pray over it. And then you can come down the aisles, take your bread and your cup. And we're going to do things a little differently this morning. If you would, just take your elements and contemplate, meditate on what they are, either by yourself or with your family. And then you can take the elements yourself. I won't lead you in the taking of communion. I want you to reflect on what this meal means and then take the bread and the cup as you feel led to. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu molech haolam Bore pari agafen May you be blessed, Lord our God, King of the world, who creates the fruit of the vine. Jesus, thank you so much for this meal, these symbols that tell us who you are, Lord. And help us to understand the purpose of your life, your death, your burial, your resurrection, Lord. Thank you for this meal that shows us who we are as your people, Lord. Thank you for this meal that shows us that your love truly conquers all, even death. The most powerful thing we are familiar with as humans, the thing that appears that it takes us all, has power over us all, there is no escape from. That this meal reminds us, no, your love is stronger and your love overcame. We worship you. Amen.